So, Professor Finn, um, you teach environmental design, policy, and planning here. Correct. You're an urban planner. Yep. Um, you've done various projects in New York City. Um, you've done a lot of sort of work from the ground up, trying to make more green space and more people-friendly, pedestrian-friendly spaces in New York City. My question is, with all the problems, environmental, social, all these different problems that are happening in the world, things that are happening in Mumbai and Lagos, Nigeria and China, what's to be done? To I mean, if you're looking at it sort of um, a human equity, human in, uh, environmental and the economics of it all, what what's to be done if you were... Knowing all the information that you know, what what do we need to do? It's a tough question. I mean, obviously it's one I think about all the time, but it's still a tough question. And if there was an easy answer, we would have done it already. I think what it really comes down to is we have to cut our dependence on fossil fuel, which seems really simple. I mean, that seems like a simple answer, right? Oh, yeah, everybody says that. But how do we do it? Um... And I think part of the problem is we in the West have a particular kind of dependence on fossil fuels that's specifically automobiles. And that the rest of the world is catching up. And you ask about equity. Part of the problem is how do we tell someone in China, you don't need a car. And if millions of you buy cars that don't have them today, as your incomes rise, which they will, as incomes rise in China and India, people will move into the middle class, they will buy cars. Because they're convenient, because they're a marker of the middle class, for all these reasons. Chinese cities, Indian cities are going to grow, and they're going to grow like American cities, if they're full of cars, which is going to be dispersed, automobile-centric, low as opposed to high. You know, all the things that we look around here on Long Island, for instance, and this is the kind of built environment we have because it's a built environment that was built for the car. So the car is going to cause pollution directly from the tailpipe or the millions and billions of cars that are going to get bought in India and China and other places are going to cause pollution at the tailpipe. They're also going to drive a particular land use pattern that's going to create the need for more cars. So it's actually going to cause a problem and then it's going to cause another problem. You add to that this problem that uh, David Owen has uh, been the, the recent resurrector of in the New Yorker and I think he's even written a book about it maybe called the Jevons paradox which is a, a paradox that uh, this uh, guy I think he was an engineer around the time of the Industrial Revolution pointed out which is as our machines become more efficient we use them more and Owen's sort of current articulation of that is if we all start by driving Priuses we're gonna save so much money and fuel that we're just gonna drive those Priuses more and maybe we use less fossil fuel, but we're going to need more roads and parking garages and everything else for all those Priuses. So at the end of the day, are we actually doing ourselves any good by driving Priuses? We should actually just stop driving. That's the hard part. So it's partly not a technological fix, I think, at the automobile level, because if we just move to a different technology to fuel automobile but still drive automobiles, we're still going to have all those unintended consequences of the the built environment being shaped around the car, requiring a car, etc. So I think really the answer is to figure out ways to build cities that are dense enough to live in without automobiles, but that can can accommodate the billions of automobiles that are already on this planet. Uh, hopefully they'll be switching to an, another form of uh, fuel at some point. But to somehow make those cities adaptable and malleable, malleable enough that as our society hopefully changes and doesn't focus on the automobile as much, that they're usable for those kinds of uh, activities, right? So that they're walkable and transit-oriented and all of these things. And we provide that choice. And then if you want to drive a car and you want to pay what it's going to cost to park it, in a parking garage or whatever, then you do it. But we've made it so easy here in the U.S. 
to have a car because parking is free and roads are free. And only after World War II. Right. Only only recently. I like to say that for thousands of years we built cities around you know, the feet and the horse and the streetcar and these kind of things. And then for 75 years we've been building them around the car. And now we're realizing what a mistake that was. But in the United States, for instance, an enormous percentage of our built environment is has been built since 1945. And now we have to figure out ways to... People call it urban acupuncture. People call it urban first aid. Um, Ellen Dunham Jones calls it retrofitting suburbia. But we have to figure out how to remake the landscapes we have to be less automobile centric. That's in this country. Now in places like China and India and Nigeria, it's a different kind of problem. Um, <clears throat> but I still think at the end of the day, it's the fossil fuel and specifically the car that are going to be at the crux of that. The get Finding a way for societies in general and cities in particular to be less automobile centric. That's our big challenge. Um, to build them dense, to build them human scale, but to also have them be affordable. And But then you have places, um, you know, in China, these mega cities that are developing, and they're incredibly dense. But at the same time, they're not really, you know, they're not pedestrian friendly. They don't have enough green space. They're, they're too dense in many ways, right? So we have to find that balance between dense enough that we don't eat up the entire landscape with housing and dense enough that you can use transit and walking instead of the car to get around, but not so dense that they become these inhuman places that uh, either no one wants to live, which is one possibility, but we don't seem to be seeing that problem in China, um, or places that are so expensive that only the uber rich can live there, like we see in Dubai. Where if you solve one problem, often you create another. If you make a place dense and livable, you might cause gentrification or price out people who you know, middle class. If you make it good for the middle class, you might give up um, some amenities that poor people, or you know, some services or amenities that poorer people need. So there's just a lot of a lot of pieces to this puzzle, and no easy solutions. Um, but I think figuring out a way to move people from point A to point B that does not involve fossil fuel in the short term, and I think in the long term, the personal automobile at all is really the, the key. But I think I think moving away from the automobile is the, the ultimate goal. And my fear is that if we just move away from the fossil fuel but keep the automobile, it's not going to be enough of a change. We have to figure out how to. Um, now, of course, I say that in the land of Route 66 and drive-in movie theaters and you know, the automobile as as a, a sacred totem or object <laughs> of, uh, of the American psyche. I, do, I don't really know how we do that. But I do think that the tide is changing to some degree. I do think that people are increasingly, as gas prices go up, especially seeing the car sometimes as more of a burden than, uh, than they used to. My son gets really annoyed when we visit my mother because we have to get in the car to go get coffee. He hates getting strapped into the car. So he says, why do we have to drive to go get coffee? Why can't we just walk? And I say, well, you know, there's nowhere to walk to here to buy coffee. Um, you know, it's a, that's how he sees the world. And so maybe if there's enough kids who see the world that way someday, uh, it'll be a different kind of place. All right. Well, thank you. Yeah, sure.